This is Microphone Monday in the studio with John Bailey. Welcome back to Microphone Mondays. I'm your host, John Bailey, and I am with the ever awesome, not Matthew McConaughey, but Michael McConaughey. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. All right, so uh, pace. We, we we have some sun in California. We, oh, actually, nice. We have no sun yeah. here at all. <laughs> oh, you lucky duck. Uh, we we had a mudslide that closed a freeway two days ago. <laughs> oh, that's not good. We have, oh, we just finally, north of Burbank. We finally got some cloud cover and some rain, so it's actually cool. It was it's been summer all up until re- this this past week. It's been eighty two, ninety degrees. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> especially when you're stuck in a booth like this one all day long. Uh, so I'm going to get the, the generic basic questions out of the way. Uh, how did getting into the voiceover business start for you? Okay. Um, actually, the first time I ever uh, did any radio, I was uh, still in high school. Uh, this would have been in Phoenix way back in 19... 19- and I was... Uh, <laughs> for a, a school play, we're doing uh, some uh, promotional things for it. And I uh, said, I want to go to a radio station. Well, sure, why not? And uh, I just thought it was really cool. So uh, a couple years after that, I uh, went into the Marine Corps. And uh, in an amazing uh, display of perspicacity far beyond my usual circumstances, I volunteered for something that worked. When they said, has anybody ever done any radio or done any broadcast? And I raised my hand. And uh, so I wound up going into uh, what they call broadcast specialist school. Uh, in the Marine Corps, um, essentially a mixture of public affairs and and broadcasting and combat correspondent, a, a big hairy ad mixture like that. And I got out of that when I got out of the Marines, and I'd always been doing theater, and I thought, okay, this is all sort of coming together. And uh, was on a couple of radio stations, one in uh, Des Moines, one in Phoenix, one out here in L.A., but what I really wanted to do was be an actor. And uh, so finally I said, all right, this radio thing, it's a steady paycheck, but pff, who needs that? I want to be an actor. <laughs> Some of us want both, but yeah, I understand. <laughs> and uh, I, I got very, very lucky in the, uh, I started, um, I actually haven't had what I refer to as a straight job since 1981, like no day job, hmm. which is not to say it hasn't gotten pretty skimpy sometimes, Yeah, but I've gotten by without having a day job. I've just been an actor. And a lot of that has been voiceover stuff. Uh, the first thing I ever did was, uh, professionally in California, was uh, a couple of little commercials. Uh, everyone chews their their bone and cuts their teeth on on little stupid local commercials. And that's a wonderful training ground because you get to make all of those mistakes where not that many people are going to listen to them. <laughs> uh, from there, I went into some voice replacement ADR in, uh, in some films and got an agent and wound up getting on uh, to Transformers and G.I. Joe and uh, a couple of other series back in the mid-80s. And uh, since then... It's been a pretty wild ride. Very cool. Uh, speaking of Transformers, I have a lot of Transformers fans that watch my channel. So how did that initially come about? Was this just something your agent sent to you? or um, Actually, simply enough, yes, it was. Um, said, okay, I got, a, got an audition for you. Okay, go over here and see this guy. Okay. Well, this guy was Wally Burr. Who I was know act- him well. <laughs> very, very good friend of mine. And uh, so I went to see this guy, Wally Burr, and Wally had definite ideas for what he wanted for uh, these characters. And at that point, he was doing a potload of shows for uh, for Marvel and uh, and Hasbro Sunbow, I think, was the company right. back then. And uh, Wally, Wally prepped. Wally knew what he wanted. And we gave it. And so he... Uh, Said, got got a couple of characters here. I uh, want you to try. And uh, one was Trax, who was the, uh, the that good-looking blue Corvette. Right. And uh, the other one was Cosmos, uh, who I I refer to as my my poor little lost child because he gets very little respect. 
Yeah. He's such a, such a sweet boy. Just, <laughs> you know, he just keeps getting picked on. Now, I've heard a rumor that uh, he is a Spanish Peter Lorre. Um, yeah, close enough. The pr- problem is it, when we, uh, we did it, Wally said, you know, I'd, I really kind of like to hear a bad Peter Lorre. I said, <laughs> well, pff, I can do that. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we wound up, you know, doing a really bad Peter Lorre. But the problem is that he kind of slides into some sort of Central American accent. It's very, very easy to, to, to do. <laughs> um, and every once in a while, I hit a little vocal oil patch and yeah, we go over the edge. But, uh. Cosmos is, uh, I, I sorry, I just, I'm so sorry for him. I love him. And, and he gets denigrated. I think it's, he's not slow, really. Right. He's just, he's careful. He's an unsung hero. Yes, absolutely. And he got his, he got his own, uh, he got his own spotlight episode. Yeah. It's a nice episode. He was a god. <laughs> That's right. Um, and there's also been a lot of, there's a, a lot of debate. Uh, uh, I don't know oh, why. Oh, God, here, here yeah, it comes. I, you know, I, I told you these were going to be questions you've probably heard yep. before. Yep. Um, especially here lately. Uh, I, I'm part of this big website called Sabertron.com, which you know mm-hmm. of. And uh, there's, I don't read the comics anymore. I, I did when I was a kid, but I don't anymore. But apparently there's a lot of things now about uh, the, the characters having some kind of sexual orientation and there's always been this debate on whether Trax was this Thurston Howell from Gilligan's Island, or was he a little bit uh, flowery? <laughs> uh, well, actually, vocally, his roots precede Gilligan's Island. Okay, so we'll um, roll that one out. Uh, well, no, I mean, there, there's a bit of that in there as well. Uh, you probably are not <clears throat> mature enough to remember a, a TV show called The Many Lives of, uh, Loves of Dobie Gillis. No, I'm not familiar with that one. Although there you I go. I watch a lot of old reruns, though. <laughs> yeah. The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. And there was a character on there, uh, played by an actor named Steve Franken, uh, based on uh, what's been described as the Harvard lockjaw. And there's that sort of thing where you go like this. And go, Dobie, Dobie do, come on, we've got to go down to the high school. Ow. Ow. I just got paid back. I just bit the crap out of my tongue. <laughs> Guys, Sorry. this is why voiceover is so dangerous. <laughs> you can't put a Band-Aid on these things. Oh, man. I'm so sorry. Did you happen to hear the crunch? I no, I didn't. Did. <laughs> <laughs> it might have picked up on the microphone, but I didn't hear it myself. Whoa. It's anyway. the first time someone's gotten injured during one of my interviews. <laughs> Nobody understands the dangers attendant to this career. That's true. Uh, but... Uh, Chatsworth Osborne Jr. was the initial thrust for that one. And uh, so during the audition process, Wally said, you know, well, uh, can you can you do a Harvard lockjaw? Yeah, of course. And uh, so it kind of rolled him out He's there. He's more and it stuck was... up white guy than uh, than has to, anything to do with orientation. So that's what that was my that was always my take was that he was just he was just that proud. And... He is. Well, proud. Right. But it's a deserved self-pride. He is not vain. He's not. He just has a very well-developed sense of self. Right. That's all. And I, I honestly believe, I don't know if you've kept up with the, with the new series or not, but I honestly believe they, they drew from Trax's character and from, from your take on the character for a new character that Darren Norris does called Knockout. Because he has the same kind of always worried about his paint job and mm. wanting to look good and having the best, you know, the, the best alternate mode. <laughs> so mm. I think they try to keep some of that consistency in the in the uh, in the uh, history of Transformers here. So that's a nice touch. And um, it's oh, back to the original thrust of the question. You should pardon <laughs> my use of the verb. Uh, the thrust that was Jack Angel's character. <laughs> no, I think I, I tracks is not. Alternate lifestyle. Okay. okay. Trax has no gender. He is a machine. That's what I, I've always been firm with that. There, no pun intended there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he, he, he values a good presentation. Don't get me wrong. There you go. Uh, matter of fact, one, one of the things uh, at a lot of the cons, they keep coming out with repaints. And uh, some of them are just 
gorgeous. And people say, well, well, what do you think of, of this one? Uh, you know, what about the, the blue tracks or the yellow tracks or the, or the well, traditionally for me, uh, blue is where I tend to gravitate. But uh, tracks finally came up with a little, a little poem when the question is asked, which is, now you can paint me blue or you can paint me yellow. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm still a handsome fellow. <laughs> Very nice. You know that that car, that toy when I was a kid made me want a Corvette as a as a driver so oh, bad. <laughs> did you it's get one? It's a beautiful car. No, I got a I got a uh, my my parents um wagon. <laughs> Yay. My my first car uh an uncle gave to me when I was too young to drive it. It was a 47 Dodge sedan that looked like a, a gigantic black pear <laughs> rolling point first down the street. And my father refused to let me get behind the wheel. And so it sat out in the backyard and slowly turned into a pile of oxide. Oh, no. And I was, uh, and in retrospect, that car was immaculate. It was beautiful. But, and what would it would be worth now today, I could not begin to tell you. Yeah, I, I was lucky I didn't get stuck with the Chevette. I'm, I'm just glad. <laughs> well, could be worse. Could have been a Gremlin. Could have been. <laughs> Chev, Chev, Chevette wasn't much worse. Wasn't much better than the Gremlin was. Uh, so how did uh, how did Joe uh, GI Joe come about? Was that with your affiliation about, with Wally? Or yeah, it was about the same time. And um, they had this this cadre of, of voice actors there, and said, "Okay, you got got oh, okay, you guys over there. Uh, what the heck? Let you just come on, read for these guys too." And uh, because at the time, of course, they were trying to expand the uh, the action figure and the the merchandising line, so new characters, new toys, and uh, they they came up with this uh, this interesting little fellow, uh, cross country, <laughs> who. Um, now, for, now, my mama's from Georgia. My, my, my mama come from down there where they eat dirt. Right. I, I didn't quite go that far. But uh, I, I will say that uh, Reb Hat and all uh, cross country is uh, pretty much, yeah, there, there's some hick in his roots. I say this without shame. Damn it, I'm a hick and I'm proud. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have my roots there too, so I, don't, I can't. I can't say too much. My brother actually lives in Atlanta, so. Um, but, but the, the thing about cross countries had a good sound system in that vehicle. The Havoc, nice sound system, which I guess sort of the GI Joe version of, of Sound Blaster. Yeah, yeah, we guess so. And uh, so we got cross countries kind of up here, and you know, got got that old Yo Joe thing which always was like putting a knitting needle through my own ear <laughs> but, but there are still uh, still a lot of people who remember him and I'm, I'm very happy about that so uh, when was the uh, what was the shining moment when you realized that this was not just a job that you actually had fans that knew who you were based on the characters that you'd done and you realized oh wow this is actually a big deal and <laughs> people know who I am actually that didn't happen for a couple of decades until um, I got contacted for uh, a convention, and honestly, at this point, I can't recall what it was. There have been a few of them through the years. Right. And they uh, said, we, we're having this, and we'd like to talk to you about your work, and thus and such. I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Because, and I don't want to get into this too much in terms of what happened uh to the series, uh, they got sold and then resold and then resold and then resold. And somewhere in there, all of the, uh, the rights that the actors had got lost. Mm. Uh, so for like 20 years or so, nobody was getting any residuals from anything from right. the, uh, and, uh, so we're, it's like we were divorced from what we had done and to find out that people revere, not, not even just remember, but revere what's going on. I, I go to conventions and uh, almost every time I'll have someone come up to me and say, you know, you don't know what you guys meant to me right. when I was growing up. Because 
no matter what was going on with me in school or, or what stuff was going on with my family, I knew I could come and watch you guys spend some time with you and you'd make everything better. Yep. And it was a freaky realization to find out that I had a much bigger family than I knew. Right. I'm very, very grateful. So uh, over the uh, experience that you've had uh, in the voiceover community, what, what advice would you have to someone who is trying to break in or someone who's, who's doing it now that wants to get into other? Because it's animation for me has been the hardest nut to crack. I've literally done just about everything I wanted to do other than that one thing. And I know it's it's uh, it's so much harder now. Technology being what it is today compared to then, it's a lot more competition. So, do you have any specific advice that you give to people to uh, to try to help either persuade or dissuade them from from pursuing this career? Well, funnily enough, um, on my uh, my website, uh, McConaughey.com, Michael McConaughey.com. How are we going to spell? It? Just don't spell it like McConaughey. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I have a link to, at this point, uh, a badly in need of an update PDF of my advice, because I always get the questions at, at right. conventions and, and people asking. And yes, my, my first and most strong inclination is to dissuade. It's don't do it. It will eat you up. Yeah. You, you will hit disappointment you'll you will ruin your life it'll it'll give you acne it, it, it's it's the most <laughs> horrible thing imaginable don't waste your time trying to get into this business unless it's the only thing you can think about unless it is a primary focus in your life if you cannot see you doing anything else in your life except this well then thicken up your skin and go at it. That's where my agony's been coming from. Ah, um, <laughs> we're not going to pursue any other possibilities. Uh, I'm a uh, I'm a big bat advocate for charity. I support uh, autism awareness, and I do something in April every year. Uh, you also have a charity that you support, and I know that that's something that's coming up very very soon. So I uh, give you a chance to talk about that. Oh, great! Thanks. Uh, yeah, in uh, in about a week, I'm going to be uh, in a charity walk in Los Angeles for the ALS Association, um, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and uh, I'll tell you, nothing with the word sclerosis in the title is good. It's a, a horrible disease that basically disconnects the brain from running the body. So people with ALS lose the ability to, to walk, to talk, and eventually to breathe. Mm. It, it's, it's a progressive thing. There is no cure. It does not get better. And it's invariably fatal, mm. um, which is unthinkable to me. Uh, and I have uh, a very, very good friend uh, who was just diagnosed with ALS earlier this year. His name is Bob Dion, uh, and he runs Dion Audio, which is a place where I've done dozens and dozens of audiobooks. And Bob is one of the, the coolest people in the world. He, it doesn't matter what life throws at him. He keeps a smile on and maintains a positive attitude. And he's uh, about as close to a godlike human being as I've run into in the last few years. And when this happened to him, uh, he and his wife, uh, Deborah, are the first thing they did once they came to grips with it was start trying to help others mm. with ALS. And uh, so they've, they've got a website, uh, bobals.com, excuse me, alsbob.com. Uh, detailing it, it's, it's a blog with his progress and what they're doing and and ways to help uh, other people and in my case this next Sunday I'm walking with the uh, Golden West branch of the ALS Association and uh, I've got a uh, if anyone wants to make a donation I would be incredibly grateful and endlessly appreciative because we do need to fill the coffers on this. The cost, the average cost for someone with ALS to care for them for a year 
is about $200,000. And what the ALS Association does, of course, they fund research, uh, but also directly support people uh, for their care and treatment uh, during the course of their disease. And it's, uh, if you can help make someone's life a little better for the time you can, please do so. Please consider it. Uh, if you just Google McConaughey and ALS, uh, it, it should come up. I'm going to uh, put all the links for everything that you're, oh, that you're talking about in the video you're, description. And You're too cool. Yeah. I'm you're too cool for screen. school. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I wish this, this could be longer, um, but... Most people won't watch past five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I deeply appreciate it. And, you know, next time I'll make sure I, uh, I have the underwear without the holes. All right. So Thank we'll have, so a vi much. have a visual. John, this has been great. I, I really appreciate this. And uh, it, it's fun talking to you. I hope we can do it again sometime. Because, yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, oh, I, I got stories just... I ain't touched yet. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you can go to the video description below and check out all the links that, uh, that Michael talked about is just another one of those guys in this business that just proves how cool and how down to earth and what big hearted people are in this industry. So I appreciate your time so much and, uh, thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome and right back at you.